الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحب أن في الله continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram uh, the book of marriage Kitab and Nikah we've reached the 836th hadith in my uh, text here the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha narrated Aisha ta radiallahu ta'ala anha Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if any woman marries without the consent of her guardian her marriage is invalid if there is cohabitation she is entitled to the dowry due to the sexual intercourse made lawful with her if there is a dispute between her guardians the ruler is the guardian of the one who has no guardian reported by al arba except the nisa'i abu awana ibn hiban and al hakam graded it uh, sahih or authentic uh, in this hadith the hadith uh, narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, there are several important uh, benefits that are derived from this hadith the first uh, benefit is it shows us the butlan and in kal mar'a nafsaha biduni idhn waliha it shows us that it is uh, not legitimate and not an illegitimate marriage or the marriage is completely batil it's it's uh unaccepted it is not a sound marital contract the woman who marries herself without a wali so this is one of the evidences to show that a wali is necessary and also the other ahadith that we mentioned prior to this la nikah illa bi wali there is no marriage without the guardian and in this hadith this is shown that this is batil or this nikah is, is not sound from the statement uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam her marriage is batil is uh, illegitimate it is not a sound marriage Another benefit of this hadith, it shows us that if a woman, if she attempts to get her own wakil, her own wakala, meaning that she, for example, she has her family, her father is... Uh, available to marry her off he's the rightful garden he's Muslim and fits the the condition of being a sound uh, guardian but then she says I want to give this wakala because I know uh, a good brother who will look after my interest so she decides to give him the right to marry her uh, the Sheikh mentions here that this is not permissible and the evidence is from the Hadith itself in which uh, the Prophet ﷺ said بِغَيْرِ إِذِنْ waliha," Without the consent of her guardian meaning that her guardian himself, the original guardian which is the father or dependent on the particular circumstances whether it's the Imam or whoever her initial guardian uh, has that responsibility. He is the only one who can give that wakala or give that agency for someone else to uh, marry her off. She cannot do that on her own. And this is the general ruling uh, that is uh, derived from this hadith. So this mention, this brings up the second fa'idah or the second benefit of this hadith. And it is that if the guardian himself gives this agency to another man to be her guardian to marry her that this is a sahih this is permissible 
and this is in accordance with the statement uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu without the consent of her guardian, meaning that with the consent of her guardian, it's permissible to give this wakala or this agency to someone else to marry her. So, to make that clear, for example, that if a the father is the original guardian or whoever her original guardian is, if it's by blood or maybe she's a revert to Islam or a convert or what have you, and the local imam is, or depending on the type of community, sometimes it's, it, it is a trustworthy brother that she feels who knows her and can represent her. So whoever that guardian is, he has he has the right to where he can give that responsibility uh, to someone else. But she on her own cannot say, no, I don't want him, I want him to be my guardian overnight. No. Instead, that wakala shows that it's a, a thing of actual responsibility and that he has that right. And this is in accordance with the evidence uh, in this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh, that, and this is really for the Arabic, uh, as far as Arabic terminologies, that there isn't a difference between the statement saying something is batil or fasid. That if you say the nikah is fasid, or you say the nikah is batil, this means both of them that they are, the, the nikah, the marriage, is unaccepted. It's Ill illegitimate. That as a contract, it is not uh, a valid contract. Whether you say batil or whether you say facet, and this is because in this hadith, the lev batil was used. So that lets us know that both of those terms denote that uh, something is illegitimate. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows us that if a woman uh, is married without a guardian before the person uh, has had relations with her then she is not entitled to a full mahar. She is not entitled to a full dowry. That's another thing which is derived from this hadith, and this is in accordance with the statement, فَإِنْدَخَلَ بِهَا فَلَهَا مَهَرٌ That if he enters, enter, meaning if they have rela sexual relations, then she is entitled to the mahar, or the, uh, the dowry. Another benefit of this hadith, Is this hadith also illustrates that if there are, if for some reason there are, there's more than one guardian, it's not clear, and they differ over this issue, then the sultan, meaning the leader, becomes the guardian. And if you're in a non-Muslim state, you perhaps don't have a leader, but maybe a leader of the community. Maybe you have an imam. Maybe you, in your society, you have a Islamic organization that can take care of these things. That takes that same. Uh, position as a uh, position of leadership there. So then that appointed leader would be the guardian in order to settle that dispute between the two guardians who are differing over who she should marry, for example. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates that the ummah will not remain in a state without a uh, leadership. And that, in fact, in all the, the Muslim countries, the even though we're separate as countries and, and as a nation, that the leaders in those countries are the uh, uh, sultans for that particular country or society. So, for example, in Saudi Arabia, the king is the sultan for this country. If you are in Yemen, whoever the president is, is the Sultan of that country is the, is the 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 leader of that country, as long as they are a Muslim leader, whether it be Egypt, whether it be Syria, unfortunately, uh, you know whatever country that is has a government that has a Muslim leader, 
then he is the wali, uh, he is the uh, sultan of that, that country. In the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and this is the 837th hadith, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a previously married woman must not be married till she is consulted. And a virgin must not be married till her consent is asked. They asked Allah's Messenger, وسلم, how is her consent indicated? He replied, it is by her silence. In this hadith, Uh, this hadith and the following a hadith we'll read the the next hadith because they they all strengthen one another and uh, the the meanings are the same narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a woman who has been previously married has more right over her person than her guardian and a virgin must be consulted and her consent is her silence reported by Muslim another narration has a guardian has no authority over a woman who has been previously married and an orphan girl must be consulted reported by uh, Abu Dawood and Nisai ibn Hiban graded it as Sahih or authentic. Uh, and in the next hadith, 839, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, a woman may not give a woman in marriage nor may she give herself in marriage, reported by Ibn Majah and Adar Qutni its narrators are reliable or thicker. In these ahadith, these three ahadith, they show they show us one very important lesson as far as the general explanation, and that is is that in the marriage contract, and this shows us this is also from the uh, conditions of marriage. And that is rida, a uh, rida meaning that there is uh, the pleasure or the consent of the man and the woman between zaujain. That means they both consent to the marriage. You cannot force a woman to marry someone, and you cannot force the man to marry someone he does not want to marry. So a rida, this is a condition of nikah. This is a condition of marriage. And from these hadith, some of the main fawa'id, some of the main benefits derived from these uh, ahadith, first, is it shows that it is impermissible to marry, uh, to marry off a woman who has been married previously or is not a virgin uh, just to marry her off without her consent that this is impermissible and this uh, hadith illustrates that and that this marriage is not sahih that the woman must be uh, her consent uh, must be sought she must uh, show that she is uh, she wants to marry this individual. You cannot force her to marry. And this is the delil or evidence for this is in the statement the Prophet <laughs> said, La tankihu. That this this shows a nafi or negation that the marriage is actually uh, valid or taken place. So this shows her consent must be sought. And likewise, even the virgin, her consent, she should not be married against her will. No one should be married against their will but as we 
see from this hadith, and we'll get to that point, uh, that the virgin, her consent is through her silence, that perhaps she's so shy about these kind of issues, which you find, especially prior to this age, and even in this age, in some certain cultures, you find the shyness, because a woman, if she's a virgin, she hasn't, uh, you know, in some societies, she really hasn't even given these kind of issues that much thought or been exposed to that much. So she's very shy about these issues, so her silence is considered her consent. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the hikmah or the wisdom of the sharia. And that the, the uh, that it shows that the sharia recognizes the difference between a woman who has been married before and is not a virgin, that she has had a different experience in life compared to the, uh, the uh, virgin who has not had this experience. Their conditions are different, so the Sharia recognizes that. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the Sharia uh, also looks to the various conditions and the st uh, status and position uh, as far as and meanings and as far as the rulings pertinent to uh, different individuals in accordance with their uh, their status or their experience and what have you, depending on the situation. Meaning, for example, in this situation, that there's a difference between the virgin and the woman who has been married before. So the Sharia, uh, the wisdom is apparent in the Sharia at looking at the different status of both those individuals. And this also illustrates the hikmah or the wisdom in the Sharia and the that sometimes this has an effect upon uh, the rulings, different rulings with regards to these issues. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates, as we mentioned in the beginning of this explanation, that that one of the conditions for nikah or the conditions for marriage is that there is rida or there is both parties are pleased going into the marriage that you have to have their consent that they are pleased no one can force them uh, to marry so this means that the bride and the groom that they both uh, are not being are married according to their will according to their their permission, not against their will. Another benefit of this hadith uh, is this hadith illustrates, as we said, uh, the that it's a condition that the zoj also uh, is pleased and that he is not being forced. So we mentioned that both of them, the zoj and the zoja, that they're both pleased uh, with entering the marital bond. Also, from this hadith, or from these ahadith, uh, another ben some other benefits that are derived is that uh, that the, uh, as we mentioned prior to this, that the woman who has been married, her consent must be sought, and that she cannot be forced and she has more right, as the Prophet said, to making this decision herself. Another benefit of this hadith is also from this that the uh, yatima or the orphan also their consent must be sought. You cannot force them to marry someone and as we mentioned that the rida must be sought from all the individuals, but it is just expressed differently between a virgin and one who has been married before. Uh, a last benefit of these uh, hadith is that these hadith also show that the rights of the woman is protected in Islam and 
likewise another last benefit that we'll meet we'll, we'll, we'll mention is that this uh, that it's very important the guardianship of the the woman in Islam and that this guardianship is a Sharia based uh, affair and that the Sharia recognizes that some have greater rights to this guardianship than others beginning with her father and those you know the the, the grandfather and the, and his brother the uncles and so forth that the rights they have a different different individual have a stronger right so the Sharia recognizes this it recognizes this with a type of uh, organization uh, with regards to these affairs those are just some of the main benefits of these ahadith. In the next hadith, hadith 840, narrated Nafi' from Ibn Umar radiallahu tala'an. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited shigar, which means that a man gives his daughter in marriage on condition that the other gives his daughter to him in marriage, in exchange, without any dowry being paid by either. Mutafakun alayh. And they both agreed that the explanation of the meaning of shigar is a saying of nafi'. In this hadith, this hadith explains to us and gives us uh, some of the great benefits of Islam and that shows that Islam is not uh, oppressive towards anyone, that everyone has their due rights and is compensated and these are the haq or the hukuk or the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given his creatures. So in this hadith, one of the benefits that we learn is the impermissibility of shigar. And shigar uh, was a type of marital practice amongst the Arabs in the times of Jahiliyyah before the advent of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it consisted of, for example, a fam two families, and perhaps one, uh, two, for example, one family has a boy and a, and a daughter, and the other family has a boy and a daughter. And basically, the men would marry one another's sister, without a mahar. Instead of a mahar, instead of a dowry, it was almost as if it was some sort of trade, a trade, uh, some sort of transaction, some sort of trade, as if you're trading animals. And this shows that this is not something which is befitting of the Muslim and contradicts the justice and the esteem and honor that Islam gives the woman and gives the believers in general and gives humanity in general and that everyone has their due rights and that we're not to be uh, that the women are not to be traded as cattle so to speak so a shigar is as uh, was mentioned in the hadith is to uh, is when a man gives his daughter in marriage on the condition that a other gives his daughter to him in marriage without any dowry. So this is also something that was made conditionally. So for example, if I have a daughter and someone else have a daughter and I say, uh, I want my son to marry your daughter, or I want to marry your daughter in exchange for you marrying my daughter. This is a condition. I've made it a condition, a condition, a stipulation. So this is what makes this, uh, this is part of making this uh, what constitutes this practice of shigar, which is muharram. Uh, a benefit, another benefit of this hadith 
is this hadith shows the tafsir or the explanation uh, of shigar. It didn't just make this practice muharram, but it gave the tafsir. So it mentioned in general the tarif or the definition of shigar or, or shigar. It mentioned shigar. Then in the very same hadith, it explained what that is. And so that shows the uh, that the Prophet والسلام, was very clear in his speech and his speech often contained very uh, very few words with immense meaning. However, in this hadith, it says that this hadith is the uh, statement, it says at the end of the hadith, it says, and they both agreed that the explanation of the meaning of shigar is a saying of nafi. So here, uh, also we this hadith uh, shows that it wasn't it, the exact speech of the Prophet because in the beginning he said, an nafi an Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma qal naha Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi shigar. So it says that this it was reported on nafi. And Ibn Umar, رضي الله تعالى عنهما, they said, the Prophet, uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, prohibited shigar. So it wasn't a statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but still, this is a part of his sunnah. This is what he prohibited, and so this explanation, as is mentioned later in the hadith that the explanation or the tafsir of shigar that they said at the end they said and they both agreed meaning nafi and meaning ibn umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that this explanation of the meaning of shigar is the saying of nafi that this was the saying of nafi so uh, this also illustrates the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhuma ajma'in their fiqh and their uh, um, understanding of the religion and their uh, articulating the meanings and the tafsir and the explanation of these uh, these terminologies and of the ahkam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows, as we mentioned, the tahrim of shigar, that it's impermissible. And another side benefit of that is that if someone were to make this marital contract, they made this basically this exchange without a mahar, then this uh, this akht nikah would be batal, as we mentioned prior to this in, uh, in one of the prior hadith about the left or the alfav or the terminology of batil or or uh, facet that that means that it is this actual transaction or this marital uh, contract did not take place so the marital contract would be invalid it will be invalid if the people did a shigar so it's not just that it's muharram but it shows that also that it is not that it did not um, it is not a legitimate contract and this is also due to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Men amila amilin laysa alayhi amruna fuhuwarad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and this is about all bid'ah all innovation in the religion meaning innovation when we're talking about innovation in the religion we're talking about uh, those things which have to do with worship and uh, practices of the religion. We're not talking about technology. We're not talking about science and things that have advanced and changed since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But rather, we're talking about religious practices, meaning we have no new creed, no new uh, fiqh principles. We may have different masail, different issues that arise, but the base principles stay the same, that we use those principles 
to understand the new issues uh, that we are faced with. So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man amila amilan laysa alayhi amruna fuhurad." Whoever does something in this affair of ours will have it rejected. So letting us know this practice of shigar, which is not from the affair of the Prophet ﷺ, this is the way of jahiliyyah, the way prior to Islam, it is rejected because it was a the nikah is a part of the muamalat in Islam. It's a part of uh, you know it has to do with worship in that sense and, and part of the religion. So since this is not from the affairs or not from the religion of Islam but yet it is a practice, it has to do with uh, something with the religion, meaning nikah or marriage, that this is a rejected practice. Letting us know that the actual practice of shigar is not accepted. It's not just that it's impermissible, it's haram, but at the same time, it's also that if someone were to do that practice, it is not. Uh, it would not be considered a valid marriage uh, uh, contract. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the Sharia uh, preserves the rights of uh, of women and that women are not just something in the marital bond is not something to play with it's not something that you just you divorce you marry and you can uh, trade women and and these kind of uh, practices of the days of ignorance but rather Islam is legislated and it is from Rabbil Alameen and these practices are civil practices and practices which preserve the rights of the uh, uh, of the woman. A last benefit of this hadith I want to mention is that this hadith also illustrates us illustrates for us is that the Sharia in general closes the door to all of those things which lead to uh, differences. That that is a Sharia principle and that's derived from this Hadith. Because if the practice of Shigar were allowed, then of course people would have uh, issues. They would have more conflict and controversy be between them. And so Islam this hadith illustrates for us that Islam cuts that pra those practices off and cuts off the controversy. Because, for example, if people uh, did this type of marriage, this way of jahiliyyah, and then one person becomes dissatisfied, or, or they have problems in their marriage, and he begins, uh, he has problems in his marriage, Perhaps in the other marriage, it would be reflected. The person would say, oh, you're doing this to my daughter, or you're doing this to my sister. I'm going to oppress your sister or daughter. So it becomes a rivalry at the expense of the women. It becomes oppression on both sides. So it spreads evil and it spreads conflict. So you can see how easily these types of practices can open up from practicing these uh, un-Islamic ignorant uh, practices from the days of Jahiliyyah. You can easily uh, envision this because we have so many Muslims that practice unfortunately practices similar to this from the ways of Jahiliyyah and they oppress one another without any thought, without any concern, without any fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People race towards oppressing one another, oppressing one another. And so this uh, hadith illustrates for us that the Sharia cuts off that those types of controversies and those conflicts due to uh, those types of practices. So now that we've spoken about shigar, uh, a shigar, and the ahadith that we are mentioning here are referring or in reference to the forbidden types of nikah, the forbidden types of uh, marriage, and shigar being one of them, one of the practices from the days of Jahiliyyah that was prominent during the time of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. 
uh, in the next hadith, the 841st hadith, uh, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, a virgin girl came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and mentioned that her father had married her against her will. So Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed her to exercise her choice, reported by Ahmed, Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah. If it is considered defective for being mursal, meaning having a missing link in the chain after the tabi'i. Uh, in this hadith, there are uh, immense benefits which also have to do with the rights of, of, of the believers and of the, of the women in general, and the women more specifically. And so this hadith illustrates uh, a very important right which can be derived from this hadith. So as we mentioned, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, a virgin girl came to the Prophet وسلم, and mentioned that her father had married her against her will. So this shows us that the woman's consent, as we mentioned in the beginning of this chapter with the other ahadith, that the woman has every right to choosing her spouse and that the virgins, as we mentioned prior to this, the virgin's right is exercised through her silence. So if a, a virgin is silent about the issue, then this is considered uh, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and so the Islamic uh, ruling is derived from that, this was considered her consent. This considered that she agrees with that, uh, you know, and this is due to the practice of being shy and so forth in these affairs. And so, this hadith shows us where uh, in this hadith a virgin actually she came to the Prophet sallallahu and complained about the situation that she was in. So let's look to some of these specific fawaid or specific benefits of this hadith. First that this hadith illustrates that it is permissible for someone to complain uh, about their, uh, their parent before a judge. That Islam does not forbid that, especially regarding some specific right of theirs. And in this situation, it was the woman's right to choose her, her spouse. Because it said the, the woman, a virgin came to the Prophet وسلم, and mentioned that her father had married her against her will. So here she went to the judge who was the Prophet والسلام, and complained to him that her father had married her against her will. The scholars mention that this could have, um, this situation can be from two angles, can be understood from two in two different ways. One, that the virgin herself did not want to be married at all. That she did not want to be married at all. This was she wasn't interested in marriage. The second way that this can be understood is that she was uh, more specifically dissatisfied with a specific suitor. That the individual that her father had married her to, basically, uh, was someone she didn't like. She disliked that individual, or she did not want to be married to that individual. So this is there's two different ways to understand this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and more specifically, this was a violation of her right to go ahead and just marry her without her consent at all. So this is the point, and this is a benefit for us that we understand this, to know that if it's regarding some specific right, that in that situation, that this hadith gives us evidence to show that it is permissible to even, and we hope that we never are in situations like that, but even that if it comes to some specific right of yours, that it's permissible for you to go before the Islamic judge or what have you and uh, attempt to get your right even if it is from your 
parents. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that the marriage Uh, of the the virgin and this is what we've been saying with regards to the other ahadith that it goes back to the woman herself not to her parents not to her guardian uh, not to her father but it goes back to her that is her haq okay it is her haq to accept a suitor or not accept a suitor because she's the one who has to live with him she's the one who perhaps will bury his children so there should be that in the case, uh, of course, uh, according to the Sharia and according to just logic and, and simple human happiness is that she wants to be with a suitor that she's pleased with, that she loves, or that love uh, is between her and her, 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 her new spouse. And so being forced to marry someone, which unfortunately, as many of us know in many of the cultures around the world, this tends to be the, the, the situation at hand. Wallahum sta'an. So this is a very dangerous practice. And so from this hadith, we understand one of the benefits is that the uh, marriage of the virgin it, uh, relates to, uh, is, is her right. That is her right. It is not the father's right. It returns back to her. That what she wants the father can try to influence her or he can refuse a suitor but ultimately it is her right it is her right he is there to help her protect her and help her guide and help to guide her in the decision but he cannot force her to marry and this is uh, what illustrates this is the statement of the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said innahu la haqqa laki ma'abik uh, that verily this this is not the right uh, of your father you know this is your right so this is a right that Islam gives to the woman another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the is that Islamic law and legislation that it takes <coughs> from the rights or it gives the rights to those who are oppressed and takes from those who oppress uh, and and those who take who want to take the haq from someone that they don't have the right to take uh, to to um, you sir and this is even in the case if the person is very close to you and for example who is closer than your uh, than your parent or for example if there was a, uh, a case of spousal abuse then and and this was brought before the judge the woman she has that right she has that right to seek uh, her 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 rights you know if the if the man is not taking care of her in a, in a suitable way and he has the means then she has the right to go before the uh, Islamic judge or what have you and get her rights. That's what Islam guarantees her. And that's one of the benefits we gain from this hadith. And we know this because the Prophet والسلام, in this hadith, we understand that from this hadith uh, about obtaining one's rights is that the Prophet وسلم, gave this woman the right to choose. It says, so the Prophet وسلم, gave her the choice. Would you like to stay in this marriage? Or would you like to have this marriage absolved? You know, would you? He gave her the choice. It was her right. So the Prophet وسلم, uh, being the Prophet, وسلم, but as also he was the judge, that he gave her the right. And so another benefit derived from this hadith is that in a situation, there are some situations, 
for example, this is one of the situations in that if the virgin would have decided that she was okay with that, but of course she wouldn't have been there probably complaining to the Prophet and Salam if that was the case. But if she had decided at that moment to say, okay, yes, I will stay with him, her marriage would be valid. Her marriage would be valid and she'd go back to her husband. So the Prophet Sallallahu he khayraha, he gave her the choice. He gave her the choice, even though the father initially took her right. So likewise, if someone, a, a friend of yours, for example, they know that you, you have a, a very, uh, you have a car that you want to sell. You really want to sell your car or your house and they act without your permission and they sell your house or they sell your car and then they notify you there's you have a choice there they have taken your right because he did it without your permission but he he's operating by uh he, you know what he knows of you as his as being your best friend so he sells your car or your house then in this uh, situation, uh, you have the choice. It's your house. You could either take it and that makes the contract, take the house back and that makes the contract uh, batil because he, the one who sold it does not own it. So, that's, so this would be a danger also for the person who purchased it thinking they were getting a house from the owner, but in fact it wasn't from the owner and it wasn't from the wakala, it wasn't from an agent of the owner, but instead the person acted without the permission of the owner. So if the owner decides, yeah, I'm okay with that, you got a good price, I'm okay with that, you sold my house or you sold my car, then the, the act or the transaction would take place. It would be a valid transaction. So that's a great benefit that Imam bin Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned regarding this, uh, this hadith. And this is derived from the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, he gave the choice to the woman. He He gave her the choice that she could have either uh, uh, um, uh, taken her right back and said, no, I don't like that suitor, or I'm not ready to be married. No, I'm, I don't want to be in this situation right now. Or she, could, she had the choice to stay in the marriage. So this shows uh, the men's benefits and that the Sharia recognizes the rights of uh, individuals and that it uh, protects us from oppressive, uh, oppressive behavior and oppression and uh, the Muslims in general and specifically the women. So those are some of the great benefits of this hadith and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم